All right, welcome to Computational Combat. We're looking at mixed martial arts through the eyes of a betting algorithm. I'm Dylan Grayson, joined by the brains of the, uh, the brains of the operation, Johnny Kaufman, and of course, a man with as much of a claim to the UFC bantamweight title as anyone else, apparently, Connor Prodder. Man, it has been an interesting week. Um, <laughs> one, one thing I will say, obviously, we're going to be looking at the Leon Edwards versus Bilal Muhammad card. Um, obviously, this was supposed to be Leon Edwards versus Hamzat Shemaev. I've said my piece on that before, but um, be safe. The future looks bright. Um, and for us, the past looks bright as well, at least when we're talking about Saturday night. Johnny, how did it go? Well, as you remember, I'm Johnny's evil twin because he failed three weeks in a row. Um, and we went positive, so I'll be staying. It went 30% positive um, and would have been more. Um, and we'll get into that because the standout performance is Kyler Phillips. Everyone said it couldn't happen. It happened. We'd love to see it. Um, Trevin, that knockout was was beautiful. I'll say Trevin that. Jones opened the night with a nasty the knockout. Night. That was fun. Yeah, That was beautiful. Um, Jan Blachowicz shocked all of us. It was a it was a model picked favorite, but we thought that was crazy, and it pulled through. And I will say, Piotr Jan, I think that was a great pick, and I think the fight showed that it was a great pick. It just the algorithm doesn't under, doesn't take into account illegal, stupid knees. And it's not like Peter Jan had a history of that anyway. Like no. it happened. And Johnny, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, does the algorithm take into account the amount of time between fights when evaluating the result? The reason why I ask is because I would be very curious to see on the heels of that fight what the algorithm projects as the likely outcome for a rematch between the two of them, assuming that like you don't need to say how far in advance it's going to happen. Well, now that we have new data, the prediction is going to be different. Based on that, that. That's what I'm curious about, right? Like the yes. algorithm has now processed the two of them, mostly Aljo getting the shit beaten out of him. Um, how does it evaluate or like how would it evaluate? Well, now their stats are different. Um, so they're gonna that's fall sad. into different classifications. So my prediction is that Piotr Jan's gonna look fantastic coming into the next one, and I think it's gonna predict him as an even heavier favorite. Here's my question though. Does it factor in the idea that oh Aljamain Sterling won? Nope, because it's not looking at who's fighting who. It's looking at statistical breakdowns based on the attributes that I engineer and I find important versus the other guys. And, it, and it's looking at that row of data and saying, oh, it's basically like, oh, I've seen this before. This classifies as this guy having this percent and this guy having this percent. It's kind of like it's kind of like um, a super fan saying, oh, I've seen a fight like this where these styles match up. And I kind of think it's going to go that way. So it's not really looking at the guy's name. So it doesn't know they fought before. Right. So, Johnny, how much did we end up up percentage wise and what would have happened if it wasn't for Peter? No spatial awareness, Jan. We went up around 30 percent, um, 30.6. And we would have probably if I didn't calculate exactly, but we would have been up because we had him as a favorite and we put a lot of money on him as well. We probably would have been up like around 34, 35 percent. And we put a lot of money down this weekend because there was a lot of value. So if you stuck with us. Um, through those bad weeks, you'd be just about you. You'd be just about even. Yeah. So off of I mean, those that, negative weeks, and if over the whole time if you stuck with us, you'd be extremely positive. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um. Obviously, I simped hard for Aljo last episode. Um. Recent drama makes me simp a little bit less for him, but to everyone saying, "Oh, he was milking it," whatever. That doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter that he's not been smart about his social media after the fight either. The fight should have been called off where it was, and you can argue whether it should have been a DQ or a no contest, but that's not his fault. Oh, I think it should have been no a DQ. Contest. Because did P Peter I have one, was under one the impression question. that he could throw? Even though the referee said down, he asked his corner yeah. in Russian. That's not – no, fuck that. Like, I, mean, I, I think it was the right call. When but, Eddie Alvarez hit Dustin Poirier with an illegal knee and that got turned into no contest, that was all that was bullshit. That should have been a disqualification. Like if you if you blatantly strike your opponent in a way that is very obviously a foul and has very obviously affected them, it should not be, oh, that's a no contest. It should be you are disqualified because you just did that. Yeah. And I want to say for a champion, like it's one thing to like ver like 
like to try and say it's okay. It's like, oh, you know, he's it was in the moment. He's a fighter. It's hard in the cage. When you're the champion, that means you're the best in the world. That means you can control yourself in the cage. And Piotr Jan can control himself in the cage. He is one of the most composed fighters I've ever seen grace the octagon. And we so to say that, the, yeah. So to say that, oh, he threw the knee because, you know, but no, he definitely thought about it. He's very composed in there. Whether it was him in his corners, prom, whatever, that's for them to figure out behind yeah. closed doors. But I think it should have been a DQ. I mean, the 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 argument that the argument that I've heard is that he couldn't see Aljamain's knee on right. the ground in his position, which is why he asked his corner. Which, fair enough, that that checks out. He should he still should have been disqualified. I'm glad that he was for it. Right, and right. the referee right. did oh, say man. down, and he speaks enough English to understand that. One other thing, just interesting for me as a professional wrestling fan, as much as I am an MMA fan. Uh, in professional wrestling, obviously very different because disqualification usually involves like, I don't know, a steel chair, but like a, a title doesn't change hands on a disqualification. So I knew that the title would change hands if there was a DQ here, but I wouldn't mind something where, okay, if there's a DQ loss, the title gets vacated and there's a rematch because in no contest, the champ would keep the belt. I think he that would have been, I think what you, that would have been the best case because it's like, Jan didn't deserve to walk out a champion, in my opinion. I'm just a viewer, but neither did Aljo. Aljo shouldn't walk out with his head low. I mean, he he he's a he goes respect for even going in there, and he took a dirty knee, couldn't continue the fight. But neither one deserves the belt. Right, I agree with you. All right, I do really love the people pointing out the irony of like, oh, Aljo calls Peter Jan a a paper champ nonstop, and then walks out a even more paper champ. Yeah, that's pretty funny. And, and it's not his fault, but it is true, and uh, it sucks. And Corey Sandhagen is the one who gets the most fucked. Um, because Aljo gets a second shot, um, Jan gets to prove himself again, and uh, Corey Sandhagen is stuck waiting and probably facing known cheater TJ Dillashaw. All right, moving on. I, I would be hyped to see him start TJ, but it'd be fun. It'd be fun. All right, Thank moving you. on to this week's card. Let's yeah. get things started. We are looking at UFC Fight Night, Edwards versus Muhammad. And starting off the night, at welterweight, Matthew Semmelsberger versus Jason Witt. Uh, Going to be real with you, I don't really have anything to say. I know both of these guys have had UFC fights in the past, but... I'm not particularly familiar with either of them. I believe one of them is one and one, and one of them is zero oh and one in the UFC. Oh, sorry. Wit is one and one. Semmelsberger is one and zero oh in the UFC, but no wins against standout names. I'm not going to make a call. Yeah, I wouldn't really be that crazy making a call either. Uh, gun to my head, I would pick Semmelsberger because his nickname on Tapology is Semi the Jedi, and I think that's hilarious. Awesome. Johnny, there is an algorithm play for this, yes? Yes. And I'm glad that last week, hopefully we broke the chain of Diago and Connor agreeing into hell uh, because it picks Semmelsberger as a 76% favorite. And on the books, he's also a slight favorite because it's pretty even. Um, but we caught a lot of value there. So if you're throwing, if you're setting aside an amount of money to throw all of this weekend, you're going to toss 27.78% of that, that to throw on uh matthew and that's this is the biggest throw of the night starting wow. off strong and if you're setting money aside like a like a mature gambler if you will you'll be throwing 2.8 <laughs> yeah um, 2 i like these plays because when no one really knows we have the edge right that is nice uh and moving on quickly to the next one we are looking at a woman's strawweight bout, Gloria De Paula versus Jin Yu Fry. So she looks a little gray in that photo. Is she sick? Yeah. So that's just for whatever reason, uh, contender series fighters have black and white photos. You'll you'll notice that pop up. I don't know why that's the case. That's the way they do it. But that goes to show you. Yeah, she hasn't fought in the UFC yet. I believe she's coming straight off of the contender series. Um, Jin Yu Fry is 0-2 in the UFC. She entered the promotion on a one-fight win streak. Feels like a pandemic pickup to me. She came from Invicta, where she was, you know, somewhat decent. I'm going to go with Gloria De Paula just because Jin Yu Fry has kind of stumbled at all of the hurdles she's been given. I'm honestly shocked to see that Jin Yu Fry is, uh, is 35. I thought she was way younger than that. That's definitely wrong. She's like our age. 
or younger. She's she's very young. That is definitely wrong. Do a quick Google search for it, I guess. Wait, um, if that's wrong, I gotta rerun this because that's the age we have. Thirty-five still. Really? Yeah. yeah. I would be shocked. I was under the impression that she was quite young. Yeah, I thought she was like in her like mid twenties. I mean, look at a picture of her because. The eyes don't lie, you know? No, I'm seeing everywhere that she's 35. I was under she the impression. She looks 35, Chuck. She looks 35, guys. All you right, know, thanks. her first opponent in the UFC was 21, so I'm wondering if I just crossed some wires. Either way. She um, looks a young 35. Yeah, I'm also going to play Gloria De Paula. Uh, the only thing that has me relatively uncertain about that is that I don't know what the exact number is, but mo- the Contender Series fighters almost always are pretty, like, pretty bad busts um because dana white is more prioritizing like this person got a crazy knockout therefore i'm gonna pick that i'm gonna give them a contract as opposed to this like prospect who showed actual good fundamentals uh so th- it's possible that she's just real bunk and i mean there's nothing wrong with the people that junior prey has lost to k hansen's good uh if memory serves i might eat my words let me check her that's that's the 21 year old i was talking about oh well luma luke bunmi is good um either way i don't know i'll take gloria as well Johnny? Uh, the ones from oh, the Dana White Contender Series. Yep, there's a debut. I got tripped up because you said you had to rerun it if the age was wrong, but you didn't run it at all. Then I went to look and realized, yeah, I don't even have the fight. Yeah. All right, so moving on from this to an absolute bu- 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 banger of a, I'm kidding, this, yeah, no. <laughs> Woman's flyweight bout between Courtney Casey and uh, J.J. Aldrich. Courtney Casey is way better than her record would suggest. She's I believe nine and eight, but like her recent losses have been to at least decent names. Whereas JJ Aldrich has a much better record, but um, not against as good people and her losses look worse. I'm going to take Courtney Casey. Nah, man. Uh, I, I actually disagree with you. I think the Crimson Chin is one of those fighters that I always think is way better than her record actually reflects. Uh, I, we've seen her fight live as well. Uh, I feel like every time that she comes up against, like, major competition, she tends to just disappoint. Uh, on the other side, J.J. Aldrich is not, like, a world beater, but uh, she has slowly been adding really nice pieces to her game. She started to get a really nice jab. She's very consistent and technical. Um, I don't trust Courtney Casey to get the job done. I think every time that, like, every time there's been a fight which will be close and not a blowout, she seems to kind of shit the bet on it. Uh, I mean, you can look at her streak from losing to Claudia Gadelia, Felice Herrig, Michelle Watterson, Calvillo. I think the Robertson loss is a legit loss, but like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Aldrich on that one. I don't trust Courtney Casey. So I'm very excited here because the algorithm disagrees with Connor and agrees with Dylan. We like to see that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, Courtney Casey, 51%, oh. 51.44% favorite. Uh, she is an underdog on the books. Pretty mid-range underdog, so we catch some value there. It is throwing for your all-pot throwers. 9.25% of that throw will be on her. And for the people like myself, you'll be throwing 0.69%. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it – doesn't... So, like, it wouldn't surprise me if Courtney Casey wins this fight. I just think that she's pretty inconsistent, and I don't know what no, part of is going to excel here. That's fair. All right, and moving on to a fight that got added to this card after I started doing my research. So that was always fun to deal with. Uh, at lightweight, we that's not the right screen to share. That's coming later. Give me one moment there. At lightweight, we have... Why does it keep doing that? What are you guys seeing on the screen? Nothing. Uh, you have started screen sharing, and that's all it says. Have you yes. been seeing the previous screen shares when I do it? Yes. I saw at least one of them. Okay. Let me know when it pops up, because I'm scrolling through everything to get to the right one here. That should be it. You see yep, it? That is it. Cool. Uh, at lightweight, Nasrat Hakparast versus Hafa Garcia. Um, for whatever reason, when I tried to screen share, it showed me the Yoder versus Hill fight. I don't know. Anyway, um, Nasrat Hakbras versus Hafa Garcia. Garcia is a last minute replacement. Realistically, this was supposed to be Dan Madge, I believe. Um, Garcia is 12-0, and 0, but making his debut, while I think that 
his record is very impressive. Um, he hasn't proven himself in the UFC yet. And Nasrat Hakbarast is pretty damn good. The one caveat I have here is that Hakbarast proudly tweeted, like a dumbass, that he had sparred 57 rounds in a week. So maybe Hakbarast doesn't have a chin anymore. If he gets knocked out, I won't be too surprised. But I am picking Nasrat Hakbarast. He's he's very skilled and he's very good. Connor, I know you're giving me that look. He did tweet that. You no, know, I, I remember seeing that tweet. I blanked it out because I was like, that's stupid. So stupid. Guys, brains are important. Like, they're pretty good. Keep I mean, if, if by 57 rounds of sparring, he meant like, like not hard sparring, just like light spar, like I, it's, it's not great. Yeah. Uh, I agree though. I'm going to also take Hacks. I fucking love that dude. I'm sa- I'm still sad that he lost to Drew Dober, uh, but Nasrat's still my boy. Uh, yeah. I don't then, really have anything to say about Hafa Garcia. Like, uh, I mean, a win over Umberto Bandana is, it's a legit win. Um, that dude's good. Uh, former UFC fighter, if I remember correctly. Uh, yep. Okay, he was one in three in the UFC. But... Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's not in the UFC anymore for a reason. Yeah, I, I like Nasrat. He's a good dude. And no call, no call from the algorithm, correct? Because we have a debut? Correct. All right, moving on to the next one. As soon as I can find it. It's got to be around here somewhere. It should be around here somewhere. It's... I have opened up every single fight as a separate tab to scroll through. Here we go. We've got... Getting there, getting there, getting there. It'll pop up in a second, I swear. You just cut this out. Or there we go. Out. Yeah, no, I'm not doing cuts. I have an exam tomorrow. <laughs> nice. The listeners will deal with this, and they will enjoy it, because we make no money off of this. Fashionable. <laughs> At Bantamweight, we've got Hani Yaya versus Ray Rodriguez. Um, This fight, I think, can be summed up in two sentences. Hani Yaya is a very good grappler, and Ray Rodriguez, in his only UFC appearance, got submitted by Brian Kelleher. That's not a knock on Brian Kelleher. I think Brian Kelleher is a good fighter. I really like Brian Kelleher. I'm a big fan of his. I think Hani Yaya is a better grappler than Kelleher is, and I'm taking Hani Yaya. Plus, you can just, it's fun to say, honey, yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah. Connor? I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to find the Kelleher Rodriguez fight. Because if I remember correctly, he shot in for a takedown, which is what, which is what led to the result. Uh, it's about to play. Give me a second. It was in 39 seconds, too. Yeah, he shot in for a takedown. Uh, if you shoot in for it. You know, the, the big question in this fight for me is how how old is Hane Yaya really? Because he's definitely been slowing down. But, I mean, he's one of those dudes who forever should have been getting respect from the UFC and just never did. Um, <sighs> I'm also going to take Yaya. Uh, I, I just I like the dude. He always seems super classy um, in everything that I've seen him in, at least. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he's just too old at this point. Uh, but generally, if you shoot in and, go, and get guillotined by Brian Keller, who, who does have a good guillotine, uh, Hani Yaya is going to put the work on you. Yeah, Johnny. Listen to this, boys. Hani Yaya. Fun name to say. Also dominant in the algorithm. 84% favorite. The books have Yaya as a pretty steep favorite as well. Um, but we still caught value. If you're throwing everything, you're throwing 18.53% of that on Yaya. And if you are throwing the correct amount so that you don't bankrupt yourself, you are throwing 1.39% on Yaya. All right. I like it. This is one of these weird scenarios where I see everyone like discounting the one guy. I bet you my personal opinion is Ray Rodriguez is going to starch him for somehow and then just be going nuts in the camera. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, MMA is not. It's not like a a story, you know, bad guys sometimes win, not calling Ray Rodriguez a bad guy. But, like, I like Honey Yaya. Uh, It would not surprise me if he's just too old at this point. Right, right. I just – that's what I feel is going to happen even as – His last two fights, you know, he had that really bad loss to Ricky Simone. Mm -hmm. Uh, He got fucking shoulder checked and dropped. Um, And then a draw against Sanhique Barzola – or Enrique Barzola. He's not Portuguese or Brazilian. Um, I don't know. Anything can happen, am I? Yeah, absolutely. Moving on, our next one. This bout taking place at Featherweight. 
we've got Charles Jourdain versus Marcelo Rojo. So Rojo is making his UFC debut on a one fight win streak. Pandemic pickup. Uh, they need to fill out these cards. Um, that being said, Charles Jourdain kind of shocked the world when he beat Duho Choi. And suddenly I was like, oh, cool, new prospect. Then he lost and went to a draw in his next two fights, which kind of takes away from him being a cool prospect. That being said, I think he should be able to win this one. I don't think Marcelo Rojo has proven himself enough. One fight went street getting grabbed by the UFC. I think Charles Jourdain gets a big win here. I think you're underselling Charles Jourdain. Uh, in addition to the fact that he knocked out Duho Choi, like Andre Feely's looked really good recently. Like there's nothing wrong with losing a split decision to, to Andre Feely. Um, I didn't see the cool about fight, so I can't comment on that, but uh, Air Jourdain, which is such a good nickname, um, has shown himself to be a significant, or has shown himself to not be a significantly higher level, but like he showed himself against good competition. Andre Feely's legit. Duho Choi is still my boy. Like, I I like both of those guys. If you're going to be competitive with them, that says a lot to me. So I'm also going to take Jordan. All right, Johnny. Oh, debut here. Yes, of course. No call from the algorithm because we have a UFC debut. And then what is surprisingly on the prelims here, we have a woman's straw weight bout between Angela Hill and Ashley Yoder. This bout was a cancellation from a few weeks ago. So we spoke about it a few weeks ago. So I'm just gonna say that I think Angela Hill is going to win. And I'm going to remind you that her grandparents were abducted by aliens and we can move on from there. No, I agree. I think, I don't actually remember what my comments were last time, um, but they probably are still true here. Like Angela Hill has seriously put together like a nice technical turnaround. Like. She's gotten much better managing her cardio, her striking, her, her grappling. Uh, she kind of got fucked in two really bad split decision losses, uh, especially if Padre Gadelia lost. That was, I, I thought she won that. Um, either way, being competitive with those two wins still puts her, like, a, in my opinion, at least a tier above Ashley Yoder, who's, like, not very consistent at anything. Uh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, Angela Hill. I, I really like Angela Hill. And I, Johnny, the only thing that will have really changed since last time is that the odds have shifted, right? Because there's not been a change in the data otherwise. Right, so I probably had it the same way, but we have Angela Hill as a 65% favorite. Um, but there's a crap load of value on Ashley Yoder. So, Yoder? Yoder. Yeah, I know. I purposely kind of, not really. Let's just pretend it was perfect. Same thing last time. I will say, Remembering a few weeks ago when we talked about it, the algorithm had a similar call and you made the same mistake in pronunciation. <laughs> so all's good. What are the numbers? If you're ever to be a fighter, your if you're nickname, throwing, if you ever to be a fighter, your nickname should be the butcher. <laughs> chop those names. And not up. because he knocks people out either. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you're throwing everything, you're throwing 9.25% on Yodel. And if you're throwing only the correct amount, you'll be throwing 0.69% on Yodel. <laughs> oh wait, it's calling Yoder. No, no, no. Where value have you been? Play. Value play. Value, value, value. Oh. Same thing. If as so, it would be retired. I might. That'd be a terrible call for a new algorithm. Is that all right? Sure. We're done with the podcast. End it. <laughs> In the past, Ashley Yoder came through as a value play for us, and I remember yes. rallying against it hard. I don't know if we were doing the podcast yet, but it, at least I spoke to you, and I was like, "That seems dumb," and then it happened. So whatever. Yeah, you're like, "Don't do that one," or you didn't do it. You did other bets, and that one came through. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the main card. Middleweight bout here, your boy, Eric Anders versus the dentist, Darren Stewart. Um, in a battle of, I'm not sure if I like them or hate them nicknames. Uh, both of these guys, I felt like I had a lot more hype for them in the past. Um, and they've each had one confusingly bad loss on their records. I feel like Anders is going to be much bigger and stronger in the cage. I could just be like imagining that, but I feel like if I saw them face to face, um, Anders would be way, way bigger. Um, I'm going to go with Eric Anders, but Darren Stewart winning wouldn't shock me. All right. Raise your hand 
if you trust Eric Anders to do anything consistently. That's what I thought. I'm taking Darren Stewart here. Uh, I, can I, this I, no, not no. be said that way? You can absolutely say it. Darren Stewart is consistent, if nothing else. Um, like that he, loss in Cage Warriors, like early on. Was, in okay, pandemic. okay, okay, okay. Let me let me just go through this real quick. So, Eric Anders, his last two wins are over GM three, which was a split decision, did not look great, and a win over a dude who is probably the worst fighter in the UFC, uh, Vinicius Moreira, who's fucking terrible. Then three straight losses that awful head kick win over Tim Williams where he was losing up or he was like having a, a, an absurdly close fight up until that point. And then the Leona Machida loss. Like we got to watch that dude make his debut against Natal. Very happy about that, but he's just not consistent when it comes to fighting. Darren Stewart, uh, no no shame in losing to Kevin Holland. No shame in losing to Shabazian. The, the Fabinski loss was right at the beginning of the pandemic. That was where the cards got all shifted around and it was moved on a Cage Warriors card. Right. I'm not going to fault someone for having a weird fucking fight at the very beginning of a global pandemic. Like, he's allowed to have one iffy fight. Eric Anders has five losses and all of them are just like, dude, what are you doing here? He doesn't show how to, he doesn't show himself improving. Um, I'm, I'm going to take Darren Stewart. I just, I cannot trust Eric Anders. Yeah. Fun fact, Darren Stewart, because of his nickname, was the first fighter to walk out wearing a face mask. <laughs> he, oh. wears, he wears a face mask to the ring just because he's the dentist. Has but, he always done that? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Really and I was actually really thinking, like, I watched that Cage Warriors card just because, like, nothing else was happening. And I was like, I can't believe they have a UFC fight on a Cage Warriors card. This is weird. I should probably tune in just to see it. And I was like, I wonder if he's not going to wear the mask because that seems slightly insensitive. But then he did. <laughs> um it was safer it was actually well yeah but at, this was the point where they were really worried about hospitals not having enough but i'm uh, sure he had he one wearing, he was a disposable face mask though wasn't he yeah yeah, yeah. The, i know i know that in hospitals they are using far better masks than just the l1 surgical mask he was wearing anyway all of that aside verdict has the dentist darren stewart by decision is the most common pick worldwide well verdict the model and connor all agree because the model has Darren Stewart as a 50.64% favorite. We caught value, my guys. We caught value, value on Eric Anders or Eric Andre. Is how, or Dude, is how Johnny would say. How do you mess up every name? No, no, no. You ended. didn't let me finish. Didn't let me finish. Names, he fucks it up. You, you didn't, didn't let me finish. I said it right the first time. No, no. you didn't. You said it's Anders. Up. It's Anders. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm from, I'm from Simi Valley, so that's how we say things. Um... That's a fun fact. No one here knows I'm from Simi Valley. But the second time I was going to make a play on the name, but don't worry about it. All you have to worry about is the value play here. On We'll call him Eric for short. Uh, if you're throwing everything, you're going to be throwing 9.25%. Um, and if you're throwing the correct amount, you will be throwing 0.69%. A lot of Takashi on this card. Oh yeah, that's it. That's it. I always love dropping the names of noted pedophiles into my podcast. Thanks. Well, dude. he's a noted. He's a rapper snitch turned rapper again, as well. Convicted. Oh, right. He's in another lawsuit yeah, as well. The dude is. Top. The dude should just become a lawyer at this point with how many lawsuits he's been through. Uh, this is now a hip hop podcast. Right? <laughs> hey, I'm into that. So I'm, I'm, I'm done talking. Let's go. You know what? I think the last thing the hip hop world needs is a podcast done by three white Jewish men. <laughs> we're not even. The, we're not even the cool Jews. We're the Ashkenazi. Uh, we're the Ashkenazi Jews. The more interesting Jews are. Uh, what's it called? Safari. Safari. Yeah, they're, they're cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They are incredible cool. social commentary here. All right, <laughs> moving on. Before we say anything that gets us canceled, oh. well, I'm fight. talking about myself. This is a flyweight bout uh, between Manel Kopp and uh, Mateus Nicolau. Johnny, you should feel really good because the first time you talked about Manel Kopp, I pronounced it wrong. So, hey, it's apparently Manel Kopp. No. He disappointed hard in his debut. It's not like his loss was like that embarrassing. He faced a really good opponent, but like I really expected him to come in here and win and immediately be like a top five guy at flyweight. Um, then you've got Mateus Nicolau, who was three and one in the UFC before getting cut. I think that was just when they were doing the flyweight purge. Yeah. Since then he's 
been undefeated. Like he never should have been cut. He's been winning since then. He deserves his spot in the UFC. But I think that Cop's loss isn't necessarily indicative of how good he is as a fighter. I feel like Manel Cop should be able to turn it around. And if he loses this one, I think I'm off the hype train, but I think he can get it done. I'm taking Manel Cop. The only thing you forgot to mention is that Mateus Nicolau uh, tested positive for steroids, so fuck him. But Oh, that might be why he was cut. No, he was cut uh, because he got head kicked by Dustin Ortiz, mm. who also got cut and shouldn't have been cut. I fucking love Dustin Ortiz, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the real question here is, what the fuck was up with that debut? Was it octagon jitters or like has, does his style just really not translate to being in a cage? Like he was very, like whenever he was throwing, he was doing good work against Pantoja. He was just so anemic to the idea of throwing punches and kicks. Um, that's the fucking question, right? The, the men all cop, you know, men all cops are bastards. Like the one who showed up in Ryzen was like an actual, uh, like, he looked fucking great other than the loss to Olka Sasaki. Uh, Did you just throw that in there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want you to know that I thought of that joke, but then I was like, we just di- we just got away from making jokes that might be tasteless. <laughs> and then stop, and then, nope, right back in. No, I okay. caught my ears tasteless in such a stuff. weird way. Jokes. I've made tasteless jokes. We're all canceled. Fuck that. Yeah, but mine's about our uh, about us. Yours, was, yours wasn't about us. <laughs> Mine was calling a fighter a bastard. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where my train of thought was. Who's winning the fight, Connor? Um, it's a good question. Pick the opposite of Dylan for Devil's Avocado. Say, I'm gonna take. Uh, I'm gonna take Cobb. I still, I'm still on the hype train. All right, and you know what? The verdict community. They say blue lives matter. They're picking cop. Okay, now you're just going <laughs> fucking mask off and you're just doing it. <sighs> None of these jokes are indicative of any political stance either way. It's I just feel like we're just going to have to like go through this and just beep out every section where we say stupid shit like this. Look, I'm not I, I'm not editing it. I think I th- I don't think anything was. Dude, at- I hope I hope enough people watch us in the future where we can't even be canceled. <laughs> That would be sick. Down the line? Come on. Yeah, that's All right. Johnny, what yeah. are the political leanings of the algorithm? <laughs> the, the algorithm is disgusted by our political commentary that for no some reason, I couldn't it. find cop in the system. I'm not even messing with you. I couldn't find him in the system. Um, there had to, he might go under a nickname. There might be some misspelling. Starboy. I, I looked up Starboy. I hate that nickname. Um, that's just a weekend reference. I think he's Haitian. Oh, then I like that nickname. I thought he was just just Starboy. Then that's kind of cool. Um, I have no idea what it's a reference to. I still think it's I, don't, I don't know why. That's something I'm gonna have to look into. But I couldn't find him in there. Yeah, I mean, maybe just because he made his debut quite recently. No, we have the new numbers. I couldn't tell you. I it what is might... your, where are you pulling them from? Um, UFC directly, actually. Yeah. All right. You know, it is what it is. No call made. Also, I'm way wrong. He's Angolan and Portuguese. So maybe it's a weekend reference, but, you know, just dig the hole deeper. Why don't you? You know? <laughs> hey, me. All right. Hey, moving me. on to a bantamweight bout here. We have Jonathan Martinez and Davy Grant. Eventually, that'll come up on the screen. There we go. Jonathan Martinez versus Davy Grant. Um, why this is on the main card and Hill versus Yoder isn't is beyond me. That's not really a knock on these guys so much as it is me saying that Hill and Yoder should be on the main card here. Um, a win over Thomas Almeida for Jonathan Martinez is pretty impressive. But then again, Davy Grant has a win over Cheeto Vera, which is way more impressive. But that win over Vera happened back in 2016 and Cheeto Vera has improved a lot since then. So I personally think that Davy Grant's win over Cheeto Vera isn't really that indicative of how he'll walk into the cage in 2021. I'm going to take Jonathan Martinez, but you know. Yeah, I 
I agree with the pick. I'm also taking Martinez, but I would kind of dispute the idea that a win in 2020 over Thomas Almeida is a good win, uh, considering Almeida's record going into that was knocked out by Cody, a win over Albert Morales, and then three straight losses. Uh, three straight Almeida. Fuck. Dude, Almeida's like, uh, yeah, big sad. Either way, um, I agree. Like, I don't think that uh, Frankie Science and Thomas Almeida are the best wins ever to have, uh, but Grigori, neither is Grigori Popov, especially if you're losing to people like Manny Bermudez. Yeah. All right, Johnny. What does Verdict say? Oh, first, and then I'll say. Thank you for reminding me. Also, yeah, give me one quick moment there. Uh, what were the political leanings on the last fight? <laughs> that that was that was the political joke. The last. Oh, one. that was. I forgot. Yeah. I just wanted to hear you say. Um, Jonathan Martinez by decision is the most common pick in the world on Verdict. Uh, and I don't have any offensive jokes to throw in there, so we're safe for now. What does the algorithm say? The algorithm agrees with you guys with Jonathan Martinez. It has him as a 66% favorite. The books have him as a fatter favorite and as a, and Grant as a fatter underdog, so we caught some value there. Um, it is throwing – if you throw all your money or whatever, you're throwing 7.41% on that. I got to think of a better way of saying it. And if you're throwing um, the correct amount, like myself, 0.56%. Also got to think of a better way of saying that. I mean, I think it's if you're throwing a set amount of money for one night, it's that percentage versus if you have a betting fund long-term. You're better at speaking than me. (laughs) (laughs) That's why you work with computers. It's very true. This is very true. All right, moving on to the next one. This one should be pretty damn interesting. We've got a featherweight bout here. And uh, very interested to see, to see how this one goes. Number nine ranked Dan Ige versus Gavin Tucker. Gavin Tucker was a guy that I was very, very high on until he got murdered in the cage by Rick Glenn. And the referee just would not stop it. And it was abject horror. I think I was watching that live with you, Connor. I, I remember being in the common room um, in our college row apartment. And just going, what is happening? Dear God, make this stop, please. Oh, yeah. No, that was the Nunes Shevchenko 2 card. You're totally right. Yeah, that it was. I don't know what, I don't know who the ref was for that bout, but I think they should have been charged with a crime, to be honest. That being said, I thought he was shot because he had gotten, you know, killed on screen. Um, Tucker's undefeated since. He returned and has been on a good little streak. That being said, Danny Ige has faced far better competition for pretty much the entirety of his UFC run. And I think he's proven himself to be a top 10 guy, maybe not top five with his loss to Calvin Cater. Um, I also think it's really cool that Dan Ige is both a fighter and a manager for other fighters. Oh. Um, that's also his nickname, 50K. Was he the one who was accused of fucking fighters over? No, yeah. I, I that's think that's the guy for monster. That's the guy for monster. No, 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 no. Oh, no, I think Ige is pretty well liked. I'm oh, not to slander his name, but I will say it is pretty cool that he does double duty in that sense. Um, I'm a fan of Dan Ige, I think he's faced better competition, and I'm going to take Dan Ige here. Um, and if Gavin Tucker wins, well, shit, Gavin Tucker's le- really legit. Um, but I don't think he does. Connor, you got a pick besides slander? Uh, yeah, while you're looking up the uh, the verdict thing. I have the verdict um, thing pulled up. So I – Gavin Tucker's looked good, but it's been against lower competition. Uh, I'm also going to take Ige. The big question for me is, like, um, you know, he he's coming into this, uh, A, off of a loss, but he's also going back down to three rounds again. Uh, which should be much more favorable to his style. At least to get in the cater fight, he seemed to kind of have mostly figured it out how to like pace himself for five rounds. Um, so maybe he'll carry that knowledge over to three and he'll be able to uh, go for a higher output. Um, you know, Gavin Gavin Tucker, if I remember correctly, likes to mix in on a decent amount of wrestling into his fights. Uh, Ige has, uh, you know, he's a black belt in jujitsu. He's very comfortable grappling when it comes to that. Um which would make it a disfavor or an, a not a favorable place for Gavin Tucker to take it. So I'm also going to take Ige. Um, right, also, and it's reasonably hard as far as things go. Yeah. Um, verdict. 
has Ige by decision as the most common pick in the world. The algorithm thought it should be a little edgy here and it, oh wait, no, 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 sorry, sorry. It actually agrees with everyone. I thought, you'll see why. Um, but it has this fight officially the closest we've ever seen. 50.18% Ige. So yeah. it obviously found value on Tucker. Um, if you're throwing every, if you're throwing the money you set aside to throw all of, you're throwing 9.25% on Tucker. And if you're throwing um, your long-term approach, you're throwing only 0.69% of your fund on Tucker. All right. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad call. I don't mind a value play there, even though I don't see it personally going that way. All right. And we I are. No, I, I did a bit of searching. I have no idea which there was. I know there was a fighter who was having some spat with their manager. I don't know who I was thinking of. Sorry, Danny Gay. Maybe it was Danny Gay fighting with himself. Who knows? Maybe. All right. <laughs> yeah. The co main event, light heavyweight, number 11, Misha Serkinov versus number 13, Ryan Spann. Um, interesting fight here. I don't know if it feels like a co main event. Um, there's an interesting amount to talk about with these two guys. Um, a loss to Johnny Walker in 2019 versus a loss to Johnny Walker in 2020 is an interesting comparison. I think a loss to Johnny Walker in 2020 is worse. Um, and I think Span has some upside, but not reach. Yeah, it's just. Height. I really like Misha Serkinov because he has a Peruvian necktie finish and that's fucking cool as shit. And I think if Span can't knock him out, he's not going to have a good time. So I'm going to take Serkinov here, but light heavyweight, who knows? Why did Misha Serkinov have such a long layoff? This will have been almost a year and a half. Probably Wait, COVID actually, like, about exactly a year and a half. Maybe COVID, he couldn't fight. Maybe he couldn't oh, trade. Yeah, COVID. No, I'm saying maybe where he was training, maybe he didn't have a lot of training. He's not like the most popular fighter in the world, so he might not have had enough resource. I like. Mary I mean, if you if you can do it, you can do it. You know what I mean? It's everyone's different. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also going to take Sirkinov. Uh, I don't. Ryan Span has not really shown anything that's particularly impressive. Like his most recent fights are uh, Nog, which why is Nog a relevant fighter in 2019? I don't know. Devin Clark, whatever. Sam Alvey, and then a loss to Johnny Walker in 2020. Uh, say what you will about Misha Sirkinov's loss to Johnny Walker, but at least he's got a win over Jimmy Crude, who I think is super good, right. or is super legit, uh, and then various other wins scattered throughout that. Um, and his losses are to better competition, in my opinion. I'm also going to take Sirkinov. And the verdict community agrees with us here. Um, Sirkinov, by decision, the most common pick. Yeah, I will say, I mean... <sighs> I mean, Sirkinov is moderately chinny. I mean, like, his, he got knocked out by Uzdemir, knocked out by, or grounded pounded by Glover Teixeira, and then knocked out by Johnny Walker. All three of those hit surprisingly, or all three of them hit hard, in Glover's case, surprisingly so. So it's not, it's not like getting knocked out by someone that's pillow fisted, especially a light heavyweight, but like, that's, it's not the greatest of looks. Johnny? Yeah. Um, the algorithm agrees with everyone and it has Misha as a 54% favorite. The books have him as a higher favorite and they have Span as less of an underdog than we have him. We caught no value here. All right. And obviously yeah. the lines move. So take that as you will, but at this current moment, no value. Fair enough. And moving on to the main event. Uh, it's an interesting one here. Welterweight number three, Leon Edwards versus number 13, Bilal Muhammad. Um, obviously, this was supposed to be the Hamzat Shemaev fight, and it got pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Eventually, Shemaev was like, yeah, I can't do this fight. I'm retired. Maybe I'm not retired, but it's going to be a while before I'm back anyway. So Bilal Muhammad steps in because Edwards was tired of waiting to fight. Um, you know, both both Edwards and Shemaev got COVID. Edwards recovered quite well, got back to training about two, three weeks later, and Shemaev may never fight again such is the reality of the situation. The thing is, I think that in wanting to fight on this date, Leon Edwards did not get the best opponent that he should be facing. And that's not a knock on Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad is really good. He's got tough wrestling and pressure. I like him as a fighter. Leon Edwards is the number three welterweight in the world. And every single time I've said, eh, I don't know if Leon Edwards can get this one done, he gets it done. 
His only loss in the UFC is to Kamaru Usman. Uh, no? Who lost in the UFC, my guy? Who was his other loss? Roger Silva. When was that? Jesus. 2014. Okay. All right. His most recent loss in the UFC was quite a while ago to the current champ, Kamaru Usman. And I just feel like Leon Edwards is going to get it done. And, um, you know, he's the number three he shouldn't be fighting the number 13. I understand why he is. And I think that Bilal Muhammad is great. And I'd be very happy to see Bilal Muhammad win. Um, But I got to take Leon Edwards here. Sorry, give me one sec. I wanted to look up one thing before I say anything. Um, Leon got COVID, right? He did, yes. A few weeks before um, Hamza Shemaev did, but he recovered quickly and was back and ready to fight in like January. The first time the fight bad. was he had pretty bad symptoms, dude. Right, but he did he recovered and went back to training full time. Yeah. I'm not so, going to say that he's back at a 100% necessarily, but comparatively to Hamzat, it's not even close. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, he lost 12 pounds in 4 days uh oh. when he was dealing with COVID. Yeah, which is not great. That that seriously makes me question how he's doing, especially given the fact that he will have had uh over a year and a half layoff his last fight was in uh august of 2019 um that being said the people that he's beaten are significantly better than anybody that Bilal muhammad has beaten uh and he's extremely good pretty much wherever the fight goes his most recent loss in the ufc has aged fucking incredibly well kamaru's super legit uh top five welterweight of all time for sure um on the other side Bilal muhammad uh they're both similar in that they're both kind of like do everything type of fighters like they, they're very comfortable wherever it goes um i'd say Bilal probably more so uh Bilal's also much more willing to be aggressive and go for takedowns and be like assert himself in that sense pressure his opponent things like that which may cause trouble for edwards um if he doesn't have any side effects from the long layoff or from the fact that he got covid though i would expect edwards to take this fight um but seriously Fucking props to Bilal Muhammad for A, being willing to take this fight in the first place, and B, um, the fact that he's taking it exactly one month after his last fight. Uh, Muhammad is just game as fuck. I, True he, Hamzat Shemayev fashion. Funny yeah. He's replacing him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, you know, he's been in the UFC since 2016. I'm glad to see that he's finally getting a really legit crack at the title. Not at the title. What am I talking about? I'm at a main about. event. Yeah, he, he's getting a main event slot. He's finally getting like a you know a really highly ranked opponent. Uh, I I'm probably gonna be rooting for Bilal Muhammad. I just, I like the dude. He's very 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 charismatic. He's a funny dude. To be fair, at one point Leon Edwards was in the conversation for a title fight, and they're like it was it was like Gilbert Burns or Leon Leon Edwards, and it was like who do we give it to? Who's more deserving? That's what the fans were speculating. I remember that was going around a lot. So, yeah, yeah, no, that was he's reasonable. Legit. Um, I mean, I was definitely on that, like, hey, he should get a title shot train. Right. Quickly looking at verdicts. Um, first thing, just before I actually give the verdict pick, um, didn't mention it, but it was revealed this week that verdict has struck a deal with the PFL and that the fan scorecards for PFL fights are going to be broadcasted on screen. So you can see when when the judging doesn't seem right, you will be able to compare it with a database of hundreds thousands of fans i think that's really cool yeah um that's awesome and i'm very happy be- because the people that run the app like they're really responsive like we're a podcast that has like i don't know a couple dozen listeners a week and like i've reached out to them and been like hey we're mentioning your app in our podcast like can i post in the official verdict app discord to like get us more listeners and they're like yeah do it so like big ups to them they're I mean- Dude, even like, even way back when we've we've been using verdict since day one there was one time i don't remember if it was junior or senior or college but it was like three or four years ago uh they i think either i messaged them first or they messaged me first and they just sent me like an entire page of just like verdict stickers for like water bottles and computers verdict's cool as shit dude i love yeah. them you gave yeah me i also i also laptop. think i i specifically go to their instagram after every fight i watch to look at the breakdowns it's if you don't like just trying to score fights or trying to predict fights and how they're going to win and play in that aspect, the aspect of them showing global results alone is so dope. I, I can't live without that. And speaking of their pick, it's not really a surprise here. Leon Edwards, by decision, the most common pick in the world and by a long shot, 48% of people called Edwards by decision. 
I don't know, man. Leon's not known for winning by decision. <laughs> we have Leon Edwards as a 60% favorite. So you already know he caught an absurd amount of value in Bilal Muhammad because not only is Leon Edwards, I feel like a fan favorite, but he's also proved himself. Leon that Edwards a fan favorite? I think he's like one of those guys where it's like everyone it's kind of everyone kind of wants him see see him fight for a title. Because I think he gets respect, and I think on a betting line that matters. I think people will say, "Oh, he fights a little boring," but I think people understand how good he is. Yeah, I just remember back in the day when there was like talks about the title, everyone was sticking up for him. Everyone's like, "Oh, come on, like this is fucking him over," kind of thing. So, in my opinion, it seems like people like him. They might not like watching him per se, but we have Leon Edwards as a sixty percent favorite, but there's a ton of value below Muhammad. Um, so, if you're throwing everything you'll be throwing 9.25 percent on him and if you're throwing just the right amount it's 0.69 percent that's the most common throw of the night it's kind of like what everyone's throwing or what all every fight's getting thrown on it's a decent value night um and i'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out personally all right that's that about wraps us up and considering how late we're recording this tonight i think what you didn't start recording uh, that's very funny. It does say it at the bottom of the screen. So nice try. Um, and we will see you guys next week for the Holland versus, oh God, who's next week? Holland versus Brunson? Um, Holland yeah. versus Brunson card. Yep. Oh, I'm excited for that. That's an exciting one. All right. See you soon.